Most programs work hard for years, only to submit an average application and predictably get average results. And on average, most pre-meds never become a doctor. Don't leave your med school dreams to chance. Today, I'll show you the two systems that got me into UCLA and have worked for the thousands of pre-meds that I've helped over the last seven years. And that starts with system number one, the six levers. There are only six things that matter when it comes to your chances of getting into medical school. Everyone talks about number six, but so many forget to optimize numbers one through five. Most pre-meds follow some random strategy they found on r slash pre-med. We're getting inspired by abstract buzzwords like holistic and show them medicine is your calling, but we use one organized framework, the six levers, to know exactly what to do next. Lever number one and two, GPA and MCAT. These are your stats, and they matter way less than you think. They're used as a screening tool by adcoms to project whether you can handle the fire hydrants that is medical school. And compare your stats with AAMC's table A-23, and you get pretty helpful, tangible information. For example, if you have a 3.5 GPA, 505 MGET, pre-meds with those stats got in 28% of the time. If you have a 3.92, 521 MCAT, pre-meds with those stats got in 83% of the time. Now remember that even if your stats are strong, they only get your foot in the door. They don't earn you a seat at the table. Lever number three, extracurriculars. Ad comes care because these activities tell them who they're getting. Clinical experiences prove that you know what you're committing to over the next seven to 12 years. And research shows you can commit to a project and engage in the scientific method. Hobbies promise them that you're not just some academic robot. Quantity here doesn't matter. Quality. You want strong extracurriculars. Do. And I'm not sure if you feel the same way, but when I was pre-med, quality felt like this abstract, hazy term. How do you even build quality? Well, we walk all of our students through this passion flywheel framework. But first, you have to know what the bar is. What does strong even look like? And the only way to do that is to read real applications from real pre-meds who got into really good med schools. We have eight full AMCAS applications that earned acceptances to some of the best programs in the country. If you'd like to join our community of near 21,000 pre-meds, click the application database in our link in our description box below now. And when you review those applications, you'll notice that every single one of those extracurriculars grew systematically. The passion flywheel states that if you start with something you're passionate about, and passion is a sliding scale, right? At the lowest level of passion, it's just something that you like. If you start with something that you like, then you'll spend more time in it. And in that time, you'll develop these skills and those skills are the things that drive real impact, drive real quality. And this is a super powerful flywheel because the more impact that you make actually turns out to drive the more passion that you have for it. It's no secret that we love and do more of the things that we have fun with and that we're good at. That brings us to lever number four, your letters of recommendation. The strongest letters come from the strongest relationships with your mentors. There's no shortcut, and these relationships are built over years. They're not built over some single emails asking you to write a strong letter of recommendation. I hate that because it always presumes that if you didn't put the word strong in there, suddenly all of your med school chances would go down the drain because now they're gonna write you a generic letter of recommendation. They're gonna write you a generic letter of recommendation regardless of how you wrote that email. It's all based on your relationship with that person. Next is lever number five, the school list. The most underestimated lever in my opinion. The MSAR is a great start and helps you estimate which schools accept pre-meds with similar profiles. Then we want to layer on even more nuance like your in-state bias or your preferred geographies and the mission statements that overlap with your application. And most importantly, we want to spread the risk out. I see far too many pre-meds applying to 12 schools and not at least considering applying DO when by the numbers, their MD chances are far lower than a coin toss. Finally, we get to the most advertised, most talked about lever number six, the application. Now everyone focuses on how to write the personal statement or your work and activities and your secondaries, and we certainly do too. But you'll appreciate now that every person doesn't start the application process with the same materials. Every pre-med brings different stats, that's levers one and two, different extracurriculars, that's lever three, different letters of recommendations, that's lever four, and a different school list, that's lever five. And just like a chef making a meal, every meal is highly dependent on the ingredients you bring. Your personal statement is based off of your lived experiences, and your work and activities are based off of your extracurriculars. My favorite analogy here is a cooking one. No matter what you do, you take a fancy sous vide, you take the best iron cast iron pan, you will never be able to turn chicken shit 
ingredients into a edible chicken salad. Now, to be clear, a master chef, someone who knows the application and knows the cooking process, can turn even the most routine ingredients into something memorable. But one, you don't really want to be put in that position. And two, too many of us think that we're master chefs when we're not. On the bright side of all of this, the converse is also true. If you bring the world's greatest chicken salad to the worst chef, there's almost no way that person can turn it into chicken <laughs> It's this attention to detail that separates pre-meds who become doctors from those who don't. And next, we're gonna talk about one of the most dangerous mistakes pre-meds make every single year and our framework for tackling rolling admissions. And if you're applying to medical school in the coming years, you don't want to make any mistakes. Our pre-med catalyst students that submit their applications on time have a 100% acceptance rate. That's more than double the national average. And our results are only because we work so closely with students. In fact, we can only take on four students per month until we're full. If you'd be interested in getting into some of the strongest programs in the country, click the application cycle advising link down below to book a free strategy call before we're full for the cycle. System number two, early. Every pre-med has heard of the term rolling admissions, but I have yet to see a single year where every pre-med understands the importance of rolling admissions. So let me make it as clear as possible. This cycle, 90% of our students have an interview by Thanksgiving. On average, they have four interviews. And I want to make two points here. Point number one is that the 10% of our students who did not have an interview by Thanksgiving, they applied late. The second point here is when you compare the students who applied on time versus who applied late, the on time group had 25% more interviews. That's a huge boost by just applying on time. And remember, medical school admissions is not some secret timeline. Since the beginning of the year, you've known when the AMCAS would open. Hell, when I walked on to UCLA as a freshman day one in September of 2019, I could predict what month what year the AMCAS would open if I were to apply on a no gap year timeline. It's not rocket science. It opens the same time every single year. So I knew when I applied, it would be June of 2022. I would submit my primary then. This has become such a critical part of our advising process that I want to hand you our framework early. E-A-R-L-Y. E stands for extract. It's when you pull stories from your experiences. Think about your patient moments, your failures, your growth arcs. And I like to do this in November of the year before. The Thanksgiving holidays, I just find, is a perfect time to go on a lot of walks, reflect on the coming year ahead. You just have a written journal or an iPhone voice memo to retell all of your favorite lived experiences. The entire point here is just to put everything in one place so that you have a treasure chest to pull from. That brings us to A, or assemble. This is when we assemble the first draft of the personal statement and the work and activities. This I like to do in December. And at the very least, we're putting together the core building blocks and the core stories. I might not know what the transitions are or the intros or the conclusions, but for every work and activities, I can tell you my responsibilities, what I did, my impact, what I accomplished, and my reflection, how it made me a better person or profession. And again, this happens in December, the year before. This brings us to R or refine, which happens between January and March. We like to revise in cycles. When we write, we try to write and not edit anything. And when we edit, we try to edit and not write anything. And when the students are done editing, they send it to our advisors who provide feedback. And we continue with this write, edit, feedback, write, edit, feedback cycle until we get to a place where we're really happy. And the goal timeline here is to really have something that you're happy with by the end of March, near the end of the winter quarter. That way, we find that when you track your application along your academic timeline, you treat your application just as seriously as you would your midterm essays or your final essays. And arguably, they're way more important than your single Shakespearean final essay. This brings us to L or lock. This is when we lock in or finalize our primary by the spring break in April. And I want you to pay attention to how much earlier we finalize our materials. Most pre-meds don't even think about the personal statement until April and we've done what four five months of work already ahead of time. That gives us the rest of April, May and early part of June while our applications are being verified to start tackling the onslaught of secondaries we know will be coming. None of this timeline is surprising, and yet every single year, pre-meds feel overwhelmed because they started too late, and now, naturally, they're writing 24-7 to try and catch up. I promise you, you don't write your best when you're in that stressful zone trying to just meet the deadlines. And in this case, we have to 
create that urgency for ourselves because we know the timeline is coming and the timeline is misleading. But when students do that, they apply on time, they submit higher quality applications, they're more comfortable throughout the cycle, and they do way better. Early ends with a Y, and that stands for yield. And I put Y in here because it's a reminder for why we're doing all this. 25% more interviews. The 10% who didn't have an interview applied late. I promise you, you only want to apply to medical school once. And when you apply, you want to have as many doors open as possible. So remember that early framework ends with Y, which is the reward, the yield, the white coat that you're going for. Throw these in your calendar, hit your milestones, leverage rolling admissions to your advantage. If you apply late, especially in this day and era where there are no surprises, I think it's your fault. If you like this video, you'll love this one here about the 10 brutal truths I know as a doctor and wish I knew as a pre-med. Thanks for watching. Goodbye.